And welcome back, everyone, to this space called the Mike Lazaridis Theater of Ideas. We're at the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo, Ontario. TVO's been here all week long as we look at the future of learning and schools. We are streaming tonight's discussion on our special website, tvo.org slash learning2030. And as that shot indicates, our producers are hosting a live chat on that site as well as our regular homepage, theagenda.tvo.org. So lots of ways for you to engage in the broadcast tonight. If you want to tweet, use Twitter. Two hashtags for you to participate in as well. Hashtag learning2030 or hashtag EQX13, EQX for Equinox. If you can't be here in person tonight in Waterloo, you can certainly still engage with us online. Tonight, we look at a world where knowledge is always at your fingertips. Toddlers are mastering tablets in no time, rendering the distinction between learning and play moot. What are the consequences of moving from books to screens? Let's find out. Our guests tonight are Michelle Cordy. She's a grade three and four teacher at the Thames Valley District School Board in London, Ontario. Our first guest from London, Ontario, not UK. Greg Butler, founder and partner of The Collaborative Impact. He's from Seattle. Eric Gregory, he's the chief field officer with Pearson, the British multinational publishing and education company, runs the foundation out of San Francisco, California. Christine McWebb is the director of academic programs at the University of Waterloo Stratford campus. She's an associate professor of French studies at the University of Waterloo. And Gersand Laflèche is co-founder of a group called Kids Code Jeunesse, she comes to us tonight from Montreal, and as we've done all week, Waterloo, what do you say we welcome our guest to the Perimeter Institute this evening? <laughs> Great to have you all here from near and far tonight, and Michelle, let's start with you. Your kids are using screens, is that right? That's right. They are in grades three and four, and they are using screens. Yeah, so in my classroom, we have one-to-one -one iPad, and it's a magical place. It's a place where my students demonstrate their learning through making movies, and they're at the center of their learning, and it's, they're creating these cinematic experiences of what's happening every day. So instead of creating real-life application, we're doing real-life application and something that maybe could be. And what child doesn't want to participate in something greater than themselves, more magical than themselves? And I don't think we often associate the word magic with school, and I'd like <laughs> to see that happen. Do you still write on a blackboard? Um, <laughs> it's very drying on the fingers. Uh, no, I, and, and in fact, I'm even moving away from the, being the center of the, of the learning. I, I resist even standing at, at an interactive whiteboard. What I'd rather do is be engaging with my students in small groups and based on what their passions are and, and exploring what might be what they're interested in. How do they get these, I, I mean, does everybody bring their own iPad? No, uh, I partnered with Dr. Donna Kostopoulos, and we did a research study about electronic portfolios, and we started with laptops, and we were really finding that was a very cumbersome experience, and when we moved to iPad, we realized the iPad was the portfolio. It was this place where they could capture all their learning. They could capture videos and pictures, and then they could use applications to further annotate and amplify their thinking about things, and that for us was a, a huge leap forward. And remind me, your kids are how old? Uh, eight and nine years old. Eight and nine. And, the, and how many in your class? 21. 21. Mm -hmm. How long does it take them to figure out how to use an iPad? Uh -huh. Okay, so Steve Jobs says that the iPad is a magic window where nothing comes between you and what you love. <laughs> and initially, it feels more like a magic carpet, and they're all zooming around, and you have to say really weird things like, uh, it would be a scary future if computers controlled humans. Apple's up. And, <laughs> and you realize that they have, we would call it an intuitive sense of how to use technology. And that intuitive sense is, a, is their uh, comfort with using handheld devices for gaming. But it's not an intuitive sense of using a handheld mobile device for learning. And that's the part that they don't know so well. And that really concerns me, um, because they're engaging in technology as a distraction and to take them out of a real deep thinking space. And I want to use the technology to bring them into that deep thinking space. You suggested a second ago that you feel less obliged to be the so-called sage on the stage at the front imparting wisdom. So how has all of these kids having their own devices changed what you do? 
I start with the same good first principles. I'm a teacher in Ontario, and my first duty is to teach the Ontario curriculum. So I'm not a rogue teacher that's sort of going, oh, I consult my belly in the morning and say, I feel like learning, and it definitely doesn't come from me. And I'm not at the point where I'm truly letting my students go on their interest. I'm, I'm still tied to the curriculum. Um, but then we look at what parts of that is interesting. So for example, when we're studying uh, medieval times, uh, what about medieval times is interesting to you? Uh, oh, you're interested in castle life. Okay, well, let's explore that, and here are some resources, and oh, by the way, those resources, they're uh, online, and they're at a reading level that's way too high for you, but that's okay, because this is augmented technology. With a textbook, you can't press anything, and it doesn't automatically read it to you. But when you go online, you tap, select, speak text. So they're <gasps> more engaged because of all of the extra bells and whistles? But be careful, it's not just engagement. Because engagement is flashy and it wears off. Mm -hmm. What really gets kids going, engagement is like, oh, and we're going to use Sparkle, and it's going to be amazing, and razzle dazzle and jazz hands. But when, <laughs> and, and kids. Did you just say jazz hands? I did. <laughs> Panel, can, are you with me on that? Oh, thank you, yes. Okay. Um, but that wears off. And, ki and kids have a sense of when they're doing something that's deep, profound, and meaningful. And they have a sense of when they're doing something that's light and fluffy. And, and when they do the deep dive to something that's more meaningful, they know it, they can feel it, and they want to go further. They just need a good mentor to push them in that direction. Okay, let me go to the other end of the table and the next province next door to us. How do the screens have an impact in classrooms in Montreal? Um, well, I'm currently only going to be in one classroom starting next week, but um, from my experience as a workshop leader, and I've done many summer programs, and I've done many, a lot of volunteering in community centers, um, the experience can be pretty impactful, um, especially since I subscribe to a lot of what Michelle says in the sense that um, I believe that we're so focused on games and technology being a distraction that we completely ignore and we don't realize the, the full depth of its learning potential. And I remember the first time I got a small group uh, in Ottawa of um, eight to 13 year old girls um, in this community center, and within the span of an hour, I showed them how to create a text file in HTML, and I showed them how to open it in a browser, and they realized they had just created a website, and it clicked that they had just created a website, and it was like moment of epiphany on their faces as they realized this is really cool. I've never even seen this ever before. Like, I've never been able to write something that will, like, that the computer will take, and I've never been able to manipulate the computer like this. And um, often, that's something that I look for in my classes. I try to create that click where like the, the students actually realize that they're really controlling the computer in a really meaningful way, and often a very creative way. So um, that's one thing that I've, that I completely, um, that has a lot of, that completely validates my experience, and I, I completely agree. The implications of that eureka moment on the kids was what? Um, I think they definitely felt a lot more powerful. Um, they definitely felt like, oh my goodness, I can build something. Like, I, the, one of the first things that the girls wanted to create was they wanted to create their own game. One of the boys uh, la in a later workshop, he wanted to be, he asked me, how do I create Facebook? You have to tell me how do I create Facebook? And I, and I, had, to, I had to tell him to calm down a little bit because he wasn't quite there yet. <laughs> and, um, but it's, it's really fascinating to watch um, kids. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even <coughs> using iPads. I'm not even using the most fancy um, contraption. I'm really, some of the computers I have to use are quite old, but HTML has been around since the 90s, and uh, it's something that I can go into any community center, take one computer, and I can show the kids how to do it. And all of a sudden, they start building together, and creative processes are being engaged, and they're actually thinking about design elements, and it's really, hmm. really powerful. Let me take it the next step. Nobody seems to be arguing, I haven't heard anybody argue that it's not a good thing that kids learn how to use these screens and get as much out of them as possible. Right. How about writing code? Is it important for kids to know how to write code? I love programming. Um, computer science is one of the things that I think about all the time. I think about how to develop apps. I think about how to develop websites. Um, I think code is very important. And I think that um, most young elementary school kids have actually no idea where they would even start if they wanted to be a computer programmer or a hacker. And, um, and I think we need to be giving kids an introduction to this world as early as possible, because I think um, it's important for the, the four points of accessibility. You need to make this stuff accessible so that um, all schools can be able to offer this to their students and so that they can explore it. And it's also something that like you, we're not necessarily interested in, in getting everybody to learn how to write code so that they can write very sophisticated apps. Really, we're just 
showing them another way to, to communicate and to express themselves, and if that piques any interest, I think that's really important. But you've heard people say, I don't need to know how the engine works in order to drive a car, so why do I need to know how to write code to use a computer? Um, when people tell that to me, I say, um, well, I, I don't like that analogy. An analogy I like better is, um, well, I already know the alphabet, and other people know how to write, so why should I learn how to write? Other people are writing books. Why should I learn how to write? And so, really, um, code is really it's like the building blocks of computer science. And um, if you're not being introduced to the building blocks of something, like the ABCs or basic numeracy and like competency with like geography and history and all the other subjects, then you're really not getting any sort of early access into something that I think is quite fundamental. And I think um, computers are changing the way humanity like exists, and I think we need to be teaching our kids more about it. Okay, well, for those who cannot imagine what a classroom full of screens look like, uh, we're going to help you with your imagination. We've got a little piece of tape here we want to show you, so control room, roll tape, please. Gregory, how long before that is reality? Oh, oh. Um. <laughs> is that an improvement? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Because, you know, we were just talking about that, Michelle and I, and it, it looks like typical classroom to me. It's, say, it's a, it's a it teacher nice in the front font. of the classroom dispensing information. It's not exactly what I think is the future of technology. But to answer your question on that, um, I don't know. I think that um, we're in this period right now, and coming from a publisher standpoint, uh, there's this period where we will not have textbooks at some point in the near future. I don't know, five, ten years, um, probably sooner in the develop in the developed world. But I work a lot in the developing world. And it's going to be a long time before that happens. Um, but again, watching that clip, I just think technology should be about students. Um, being able to take ownership of their own learning, not just replacing this standard call and repeat, sage on the stage approach. And that's what that looked like. That's in your what view? it looked like, and it looked to me a little bit like um, it, it looked to me a little bit like there probably wasn't a lot of professional development for that person. And I always say that if technology companies want to get into education, they should couch everything they provide as a professional development program. It is not just use this iPad, use this smartphone. It's got to be built around teachers changing, change management, change the way you are in that classroom. Don't just do a uh, uh, status quo. So. Okay, very interesting. Um, I hope it doesn't look like that in the future, though. <laughs> Tell me this. Who makes more educational books in the world than Pearson? Nobody. <laughs> so how are you not terrified of a future where there are no more books? I, I think it's going to be great. Um, I think if you look at what a textbook does. It's, look, it's the, tra it's the tool that we have right now. Um, it's changing, which is fantastic. I think there's, gonna, there's a blended um, solution. Eventually, it, 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 I'm not sure if there will be no books. I'm assuming there won't be. Um, but if you look at the experience of a student who's just kind of passively looking through a printed textbook, and then you look at how they can jump off, as Michelle was saying, and making these curriculum-based films in order to show you what they've learned, that's fantastic. I'm all for it. Christine, a book is a single thing. A screen, a tablet, is many, many, many things. That's right. How does that make a difference? I think that um, as we move to, to tablets and um, other technologies, digital technologies like that, um, there is a certain breakdown in linearity. So when, when you take a book, there is a beginning and, and an end. Um, and you usually move through it from beginning to end, unless you are a reader like me who gets impatient and kind of reads the last two pages to find out what happens, <laughs> which is a terrible thing. But then it's, there, there's just, I mean, it's, it's linear reading, right? Um, whereas if you just want to talk about reading per se, when you read on, on a tablet uh, of any kind, the linearity breaks down, um, which I think is ultimately a good thing 
because what it allows us to do is as you read um, and you don't understand a word, for example, or you want to look up a definition or you need more information on something else, um, you have that available to you literally at your fingertips and you can move back and forth. But I do think there are going to be um, uh, changes in our cognitive behavior uh, because of that. It's, it's, I think that the, that type of technology is so pervasive in a sense that it really is going to bring about a, a change in our mindset. That's what I wanted to follow up on. This has the potential to, in some respects, rewire our brains, does it not? I think so. I mean, I'm, I'm not at all a, a neuroscientist, obviously, but um, you can already see it in, in the way even the, the young generation now that is in schools um, thinks about in information. So when you, when you go to a regular curriculum, I mean, you, you have your segmented disciplines that come in, in, in silos, and that really reflects the way that have, we have been processing information, if nothing else. There are lots of other reasons for it, but um, that as well. So the way we have been processing information is much, much more uh, linear, organized, structured in batches kind of thing. Whereas with um, the new digital technologies, um, there is no need for that anymore. And when, when children nowadays, when, the, when they need to find information on whatever topic, and even if they just Google it, I mean, there is nothing to say that information doesn't come from social sciences, from the arts, from physics. I mean, it comes from all kinds of different disciplines, right? Mm. So um, the word interdisciplinary means something to us. I don't even think it means anything to the younger generation coming up, it just is. It's just natural, that's there's the way it goes. A, there's a huge danger there too. I mean, when you present that to a student, when you present a textbook, a textbook does, it's kind of has a, a positive side to it. It's been filtered, it's been selected, it's bounded. So that linear knowledge adds a certain level of support to the teacher and to the student in the classroom. So, uh, and it, the unbounded nature of knowledge online and with these devices is very, very powerful. But we have to be thinking about the whole set of skills then that go around that. And, and if, yeah, and if a teacher's gonna move from the front of the classroom into the center, the teacher really needs to be a curator. That's quite a huge role that teachers can play to kind of combat that, I think. Absolutely, and to be a curator, you have to hone your attention skills. You have to be able to be, I joked earlier about, you know, it'd be a scary future of computers controlled humans, but if you're skipping happily hy hyperlink to hyperlink through, so you started with your book, but now you're off to something else, are you really achieving your task at hand? And that's a risk that we all face as we love love with technology, and we need to be teaching about that. Greg, but let me get you in at this point here. How, sure. how, help, it, help us understand or characterize for us, if you would, the significance of this moment in history as we appear to be moving away from books and towards screens. Well, I, I don't really see us moving away from books. I think we might move away from paper-based books, but mm -hmm. we are moving to a different form of reading material. In fact, one of the things that I think is really interesting is it actually opens up access to more reading material in more forms. So. Whereas before, if I'm limited to books, um, then I'm limited to just one form. But now I have information that may be based on a narrative form, it may be based on other forms, it may be short text, it may be long text, it may be deep research. And I have all of those things available to me in the one device, which allows me to do a lot more with information. So to pick up on Christine's point, allows me to bring together information and start to build new knowledge. So I think one of the most important changes we're going to see is that we've lived in a world that's been heavily focused on consumption mm -hmm. of reading and consumption of information. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to move quickly to a world that's driven by creation. Mm -hmm. And so this is a tool that allows people to, to create new knowledge. And one of the pieces of work that, that we're working on at the moment, um, the, the company that I work for, is looking at how we can build a partnership that works with, in, um, say, sub-Saharan Africa and the developing parts of the world where you can get access to low-cost devices, a $50 to $100 smartphone, and people can start to publish their own books, their talking books, on that phone in their local language, supporting their local culture. So while in Canada it's really easy to find books about Canada and about local culture, if you go to many countries, you actually can't find those books. So they're not there in the local language. And so what happens is that we get this sense that books are, are taking away from the culture, what we're trying to do is say, if people can easily publish their own books and distribute them and can make a million copies or a hundred million copies very easily, hmm. it changes the, the ball game altogether. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Gerson, do you think children have an instinctive understanding of what's underneath the screen? How to manipulate it, how to make it work? 
Um, do you mean the hardware or how to interface with it? Y interfacing. Interfacing. Um, well, I think um, whether they've been able to steal their parents' gadgets and mess around with them and install a bunch of games, or whether it's um, the fact that they were so that they're so young and it's and it's an ever-present condition of their life. Yeah, I do think that uh, uh, the more privileged children, um, and I use that word. Um, it's a, it's a difficult word to use, but I'm going to use say that. And the more privileged children definitely definitely have a more um, more understanding of how to interface with technology and how to do go Google search and how to like right click to access different functions like sort of speech uh, saying speech of the text that they're seeing on the screen um, for other kids who may not have had the same amount they only see gadgets as um, uh, consumption devices they only see the ability to check out the latest music or to download like a game mm. um, so it's there's definitely a range and definitely sometimes in the classroom I do need to bridge that I gap. have a real world yeah. example of that yeah. very recent so <clears throat> um, Pearson has partnered with Apple to uh, uh, LA Unified School District has decided to give every student in the school district an iPad they're in the process of doing that right how now. many students is that? 600,000 students um, yeah uh, and um, what Pearson has done is created some tools to go along with the iPad, so it's not just handing them over um, a, a device, but there's actually uh, uh, lessons that are tied to curriculum there. And it's very interesting because I kept thinking the whole time, you know, you've got to let these kids have access to the internet, otherwise this iPad is useless. But they were, the district was very worried about that. So they handed out to a pilot, 47 schools, they handed out the um, iPads, and within a couple of hours, all the kids had figured out how to hack through and, and get into the, <laughs> no the internet. Kidding. And they into were the tweeting sites. and cyberbullying and doing all the things you didn't want them to do. Um, and so I think the reason I bring that up is I think we need to be really realistic when we talk about giving kids these devices. And, and, and to your point, they know how to do this stuff. And if only two of them know how to do it, everyone's going to know how to Michelle, do it. Michelle, is that your experience with grade threes and fours, that even if you tell them, don't go on these sites, it's They're like do when it? you say to students, you're like, you're working on your own. Answers are yourself. You want them to, and as soon as somebody knows the answer to the problem that you're trying to solve in math, it somehow just disperses through the classroom. Mm. Yeah, so there's kind of like the secret lives of children where they share information. Um, but, you know, uh, and as soon as you say that you can't do something to a child, <laughs> oh, Guaranteed. delicious. Yes. They want to go in and, and dive and see what that's all about. And, and why are we holding that back? And uh, why are we letting our students go forward and say, okay, this is the walled garden that you're going to play within. And, uh, and, and this is sort of the boundaries of, of what you're going to do. And do they respect that? My students respect that, that's... and there are, are tools to make that happen. But you're a good teacher, and see, that's the thing. That's why I keep saying this has to be about professional development. All mm -hmm. of that stuff I'm a teacher with support, and you're, you're absolutely right. I'm a teacher that has a lot of support. I partner with wonderful mentors. I partner with Apple. I partner with teachers that want to experiment and see what might be. So I really appreciate your point yeah. about that it does have to be contextualized with support. Okay, Sorry, we're about halfway through tonight. Let me do a little business with the folks at home for a second because we want to remind you. We're at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics as we have been all week long. We're here all week, five programs in Waterloo, Ontario as part of the Equinox Summit. If you can't be here, we'd still love it if you'd participate with our program. Our producers, as that shot indicates, are hosting a live chat on our main page. That's the agenda.tvo.org. You can also reach us via Twitter. Use the hashtag Learning 2030, that's been the name of our series for the whole past year, Learning 2030, or EQX13, and participate in the discussion tonight. Now, throughout the course of the week, we've been introducing you to one of the guys who is really seen as a visionary in this field. His name is Sugata Mitra, and we've been showing various clips, and I think it's time we saw another one right now. Roll tape. A five-year-old today, by the time he's 25, it's going to be 2031. Can any teacher say that they're preparing that child for 2031, for an unknown world? But I believe that I can make a curriculum for that teacher. And that curriculum needs to have only three things in it. Reading comprehension is the most critical skill at this point in time for a generation that's going to read off screens for the rest of their lives. Information search and retrieval skills. If people know what are keywords, follow a link or not, it's a key skill. If arithmetic is an outdated skill, this is the skill that will replace it. And finally, if a child knows how to read, if a child knows how to search for information, how do we teach them how to believe? How early in a child's life can we put that in there? If we can do it really, really early, 
then we would have armed that child against doctrine. Hmm. That doesn't come as trippingly off the tongue as the three R's, <laughs> but that is a prescription, right? Comprehension, information retrieval skills, and guarding against doctrines. Let's just consider that and ask if there's anything else we want to either add or subtract from that list. Start sure. us off. I think, I think Sagata might have a point, but I think it's bigger than that because I'll pick up on this point. You are giving children a very powerful tool and there are pluses and minuses of doing that. So some of the work that we're doing is looking at a new, defini a de a new definition of what the important skills are and we call them deep learning skills. Why deep learning? Because a lot of the, the learning about consumption, a lot of the textbook learning is very shallow. It's, it, there's no depth to it. But suddenly you've got a tool where you can do deep research, you can create your own books, you can create your own materials, you can create your own movies. And so you need skills around things like creativity and things like critical thinking and problem solving, like character becomes important. Self-control, regulation, all those type of things are, are more important now. The ideas of collaboration, because you have a tool that is naturally a collaboration device. So if we don't focus on those, then Firstly, we're missing the opportunity that exists because there's huge opportunity to, to take benefit from those, those tools that are there. But we're also not serving the children who will need those skills in their future, to Sagata's point in 2030. Christine, you want to add or subtract from that list? Um, well, what I would just like to add is that I, I think that um, children need to need to have competencies in, in a whole range of skills, really. And, and by skills, I don't mean, um, you know, I mean, obviously they need the basic skills in math and, and, and literacy and that sort of thing. Um, but what we call the soft skills, I don't really like that term for, <laughs> for various what reasons. What does it refer but that's, to, though? That's, that's the term that we've been using. So it's, it's what Craig was saying. It's the, the idea of being able to analyze something deeply and uh, uh, to, to think critically, um, to problem solve. And problem solve has become kind of a trivial term, but what that really means is, um, I think the, the children of, of the future, and even now already, need to be able to um, address large complex problems and be able to solve them, but they won't be able to solve them alone. Mm -hmm. So really what it means is that you kind of, we were earlier talking about the T-shaped learner. And what that is, is that um, uh, children, uh, may be taught comp very deep competencies in two or three areas and become kind of experts, if, if you will, in, in those areas. Um, but they will also have a broad range of competencies so that they may not be able to execute in those areas, um, but they certainly understand what people are talking about when they talk uh, in those areas, for example. And I think uh, another uh, another aspect that's very important, what I already touched on, is that um, nobody is going to be able to solve complex problems alone. Mm -hmm. So the idea of, of connected learning, be it in, in a physical classroom or in a virtual classroom, depending on the resources that we have available to us, um, is going to become increasingly important Good. to my mind. Michelle, what would you add or subtract on the list? That we need to be brave and that having our voice online and, and, this, and I very much agree with students being uh, creators of knowledge and that does something maybe that you wouldn't expect. I think it has downstream effects for democracy. I think coding, there's some danger there. I think it might be teaching Latin, what, like teaching Latin was a generation ago, but there could be something where it's the underpinning of democracy. When students create artifacts of their learning and they have a voice online and they realize that that's a real thing and we take them seriously and we take their knowledge seriously, I think that could have downstream effects for people being more engaged in their communities. And when you make that artifact, you, you, it's very difficult to make a really cool video that's all selfies, so you have to work <laughs> with, your, with your peers. And so we're learning that, hey, this requires a team of people. These are the skills that we need to move forward to solve those great problems that, that you're speaking to, but also to feel brave enough that we can go out and that belief piece that was in the video, let's believe that this is the world that we can create, because that is indeed the truth. So we might get more engaged citizens who might actually vote <laughs> that would run for office, that would vote, <laughs> that would hold a community picnic. Whatever range on that continuum of democracy would like to place those social events, that's only going to happen when children in classrooms believe that somebody is listening to them and somebody is letting them drive the curriculum. Gotcha. Eric. Uh, I think we need to make sure that we are teaching students to be discerning about all of this information mm -hmm. that's out there. It's extremely important. And right now they have two worlds, right? They, the second they leave school, it becomes very complex. They're, they're trying to figure out how they 
uh, use Twitter with friends. But when they're in the classroom, it's a completely different experience. So I think all the more reason to bring technology into the classroom to help them kind of live that full life, but discern and, and know what matters and what's real. Cherson, you want to add coding to the list? <laughs> Um, I, um, I, I, I definitely see the, 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 the concern. Um, uh, I recently, uh, in one of my uh, coding workshops this uh, summer, a parent emailed me and said, my six-year-old daughter cried and cried until I let her take your workshop, so I hope you don't mind, she's a little younger. And I was like, no, she can come, I'm very excited. And, you know, I do need to do quite a bit of hand-holding, and she was a little bit younger, and, but she was just as keen to follow along, and she was just as keen to check out what everybody was doing. And what I was, was the average age? The average else? age was seven to eight, so she was just a little, a younger. little bit younger. And, um, and, uh, and you know, I, I would try to explain, um, we were using Scratch at the time, and I was trying to explain to her what a loop was. So, you know, you, you, you tell the thing to do that, and it's going to keep doing it until the end condition is met. And she would nod and really, th I like, okay, I get it, I understand, I'm going to go build that. And arguably, like, you could say, well, the next day, she's not really going to actually be able to explain what she did. She knows that she built it once, but it's maybe not there. Um, but I definitely think that if you're a good teacher and like and, and and you can build on that I think that's tremendously valuable to introduce at a young age especially with tools like scratch and especially with tools like HTML because they create a visual product afterwards that the kid can really identify with and say I built that I see the the header and the colors and the way the mouse shines up I made that happen and I think that's very important because I think kids love making things they really do one of the uh tweets that we just saw come up on the screen, and we haven't heard the argument yet advanced during our discussion, is that it might be better for the environment as well yeah. uh, if uh, everybody's off screens instead of chopping down trees for books. Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Uh, Christine, you work in the world of academia, and that is a world which really very much uh, prizes individuals uh, scurrying themselves away in their offices for long periods of time and we pumping out, well, pumping out <laughs> scholarly papers and this type of thing. But that kind of individual pursuit, if I'm hearing correctly here tonight, may be a thing of the past. Fair to say? <laughs> you really want me to answer this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I did ask it, so yes, I think I do want you to answer it. Um, well, I think it, it depends, first of all, it depends on the type of research that you're doing. Uh, okay, I'm going to be frank. Um, I, ideally, I would say that the same kind of connectedness that uh, we encourage in, in children and that is being encouraged by the technology, because let's face it, I mean, societal changes are already uh, coming about because of the technology. I mean, a lot of it is driven by it, right? Um, and I, I do think that the same thing is happening uh, in academia as well. Um, there have been, uh, in, I mean, in a lot of areas, there has always been collaborative research. Uh, in, in my field of research, not so much. Um, in, in the arts, you're right, it's uh, mostly the lone researcher in his or her office, mm -hmm. tucked away and working on the next article or the next book. And I think it is in everybody's best interest if um, we reach out more. Uh, if we kind of break down the wall of the ivory tower. Do you folks know how to play nice in the sandbox with each other? <laughs> no, not yet. You don't yet. No, you don't. <laughs> no, so this yes, may actually force you to push yes, the edges of yes, your comfort zone a bit. <laughs> you skills need a baker's thing. <laughs> we shall yes, see. We, yes, we, yes, we do. But um, no, I, I do agree. And I mean, it's, it's definitely um, happening. And I think uh, more connectedness in academia is a good thing. Good. <laughs> uh, Michelle, if, if your job in the future you've started it already, is going to be less about here's what I know and I'm going to impart what I know to you students out there. If that's not going to be your role going forward, what is your role going to be going forward? Let's be clear. I'm a hardworking teacher. I'm among many hardworking teachers in Ontario. At no point did I know everything in the curriculum. <laughs> At some point, I had to do some digging. And, and I wasn't really necessarily sure if, if the digging that I was doing was going to be the, what the students were most interested in. So let's put that 
on the students. Let's have them say, this is, this is I, like I said earlier, I am an Ontario teacher, I teach the Ontario curriculum, but let's push it out to the students and say, okay, well, what aspects of this are you interested? Where are you strong? Where are you weak? How can I bridge those gaps? So I see myself as, I still need to, to deliver a lesson. Uh, my students are eight and nine years old. Mm -hmm. So there is still a place where you stand up and you say that this is, this is the concept and we need to do it. We need to label things and we need to use explicit language. So teacher-directed learning is not completely lost because after all, I'm still the grown-up in the room. But let's push it out to our students more. Let's have them not make a movie at the end, an iMovie at the end of their unit to express the, all the wonderful things that they've <laughs> learned. Let's have them do it throughout as a process of understanding. And let's flip, start to flip that around and, and move where these assessment pieces are happening. You know, is it going to be the postmortem of their learning? And oh, here's a project to go home, or is it something that we do throughout to experience learning more deeply? Greg, do we? yet completely understand how teaching is going to be completely revolutionized once the room is full of screens rather than just chalk and a blackboard? Well, I, I hope that we, we're on a journey to understand that, and I think we will be on a journey to understand that for the next 17 years and more, because what is critical is that we have teachers who are learners and learners as partners with other learners in the classroom. Hmm. I think in a, in, in a modern classroom like Michelle's talking about is, the teacher has a role of being a learner, that's for modelling purposes, to show the students how to use the tools, but also how to learn, the processes about learning. And I think one of the challenging things about learning is it's a pretty complex thing because it's only inferred, you can't really see learning. And so how do we demonstrate something that's inferred to, to third graders or whatever? We need to be able to model it. So I think what we're going to see is the role of the teacher will change to be more of a partner and someone who can help partner with the students have the students partner with the other students, and then they can move the learning along together. I think that is a big shift because we've come from a, a, a background of, of this notion of teachers being at the front of the room quite often and being the ones who know all the answers. And that really doesn't serve where we are when we have unlimited, info, unlimited access to information, where students can ask problems, and when we don't need to measure them on what they can recall, but more on what they can do. Mm -hmm. hmm. Eric, uh, I wonder if you could follow up, just based on your experience, obviously, uh, largest in the world, publisher of educational tools, what percentage of teachers do you think are frightened that the world is changing in a way that will, in some respects, turn on its ear the way they were taught to teach once upon a time? Yeah, I think that um, it's... I, I, they're afraid of that anyway, regardless of technology, because I think they hear there's a lot of, of chatter out there about the fact that they do need to get into the middle of the classroom, and they don't necessarily think that technology is going to do that. Um, but I'll give you the case in, in Los Angeles. Um, I, was, I was really concerned that after the first week of this implementation with these pilot schools, that these teachers would just be terrified. Well, I think a lot of teachers are really scared of looking stupid in front of their kids. And so you get in a device in front of them and they're not quite sure what to do and it's just mayhem. But again, because we focused on a really robust pre-service, training before they, they put it into the classroom, um, that made all the difference in the world. So I think they come a bit kicking and screaming and afraid, but as I have been hounding since the beginning of this program, it has to be about professional development. It has to be about professional development, meaning? Meaning that, you can, again, you cannot just go to a teacher and say, here's the curriculum, here's some books, here's some stuff on an iPad, go for it. You really right. need to spend a lot of time with them, explaining to them what the possibilities are and how you actually get a good teacher like Michelle, who's done this, to come in or create some sort of program that shows those teachers what the possibilities are. And I think it's a lot more than just um, having them use the technology. I think the key point here is that you're re-engineering learning. Yeah. So it's not just around the device. I mean, there's a big push that needs to happen around when we, have, when we live in the society where information is so broadly available, where kids generally have access to these devices out of the classroom, mm -hmm. then how do we engineer a learning experience that's highly relevant and really going to drive the type of learning okay. that will take those kids I, I don't want to stereotype anybody here, but, um, well, let's just state the obvious. If you're a new teacher in your 20s or your 30s, it's probably going to be easier for you to adjust to this than if you're, say, 
in your mid-50s and you're just a few years away from retiring from the classroom. You're that, all shaking your head. You're saying you're wrong. That makes, that makes, no? that makes the question if, any, if, if the pre-service program is, is different than the pre-service program that, the, that somebody else experienced. So yes, they may live in a cultural context where mobile technology was more custom to what they did, but to what degree uh, are the, our teacher education programs embracing technology and, and where does that technology fit? What I hear you saying is the pedagogy needs to drive the technology in right. other way, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I mean, there's a lot of pressure on faculties of education and we end up having these debates we've reduced it back to well we just need to improve teacher training and that's not that's just one piece of it and in fact you know we, we were speaking of these frightened teachers oh poor us um, but you know we exist in a much broader context um, and and so I think that we a lot of us need to be brave our parents need to be brave our students need to be brave teachers need to be brave as well and when we look at the education context today I don't think that we're looking to I don't think when we look at a classroom we think is this the classroom that's preparing us for 2030 in fact in fact, I'm not even certain that we're looking at the classroom saying, is this the classroom that would prepare our students for today? Mm -hmm. I think that the anchor that we use to evaluate our classrooms are our own classroom experiences. So I actually think they're 20 years dated. Well, mm -hmm. this is the thing. Everybody's an expert in education because everybody <laughs> at one time in their life went to school. Right. And Gerson, I wonder if, and I'll pick up on your comment there, Michelle, I wonder if parents aren't a big part of this problem here because certainly this experience that we're all talking about tonight is utterly alien from anything any parent experienced when he or she went to school however many years ago. Are they part of the problem, selling parents on this new vision? Um, ah, uh, problem, that word. Um, <laughs> I, part of the challenge then, let's put I it don't, that way. I don't want to call parents problematic because they, they're so important to the learning process and they really, really care about their, well, hopefully they really care about their kids. And um, I think it's, it's really, we come from this culture of, um, uh, we use technology so much and it's really, uh, we're, we're consumption-based culture and we don't think from the point of view of a cre creation or a creative based culture and I think a lot of parents when they see technology in the classroom they're thinking video games and distraction and scary things like the internet and um, uh, I, I just I, I, the moment you start talking to them about how we're actually we're trying to really get children to understand how to create and how to be educated with these things and and we're really and we're talking about reshaping pedagogy and then most parents start to nod their heads and say this makes sense hmm. I think Parents are the opportunity. I mean, parents are really are the opportunity because they're part yeah. of that learning equation. They're part of the partnership that needs to happen. Yeah. And so, yes, they need probably to have a better understanding of why and how technology can improve pedagogy and learning and, and what their child will be doing. But I find that when most parents understand that, they're fully supported. They're on board. Let me make one reference to um, the fact that this is a family program. We're on live at 8 o'clock at night. and. Uh, it's G-rated for the most part, but apparently somebody's been having some fun out there spamming our Twitter feed or some, is that right, the Twitter feed? Because there's been some rather blue language that has apparently gone up on the screen wow. during the course of the evening. Yeah. And we just want everybody to know that that's not us doing that, that's somebody out there having fun with us. And... Um, are the dangers of the internet. It is what it is, exactly. There we go, it is what it is. And, and teachable moment, what should yes. we do about that? Exactly right. If uh, you are still, t we've called this series Learning 2030, because a kid born right now is going to go maybe to your university in 17 years' time after they graduate from high school. Do you have any concept, Christine, of what your classroom in 17 years, when that kid is ready to enter it, will look like? Um, I mean, I, I can't, I don't have a crystal ball, so... Um, <clears throat> You'll still be teaching, of course. I will still be teaching. I, I, can, I can tell you what I think it might look like, and perhaps in just a little bit of idealism <laughs> into, into sure. my answer. Um, what I am hoping for uh, is that classroom spaces, so when we talk about the physical spaces, uh, will be much more flexible and, and much more fluid. Um, not only at the university level, but at, at any level, really. So no more of these rows and of desks and all of yeah, that so, history. Yeah, so for example, in, um, at the Stratford campus, which is where I teach, I have conducted a little experiment, actually, but I don't have enough data yet to see how it's really going. And it's, it's really just on, on a small scale. So, uh, a scale. so our uh, space is very, very flexible. And in fact, the entire building 
um, was designed in such a way that the teaching space is not just in the classroom, but the entire campus is the teaching space, and in fact, the entire community is the teaching space. And this is, um, this is really an example of innovation by design. So the, the building was designed with lots, of, and lots and lots of natural light and uh, lots of glass, which symbolically then means that we want to project out, so our ideas kind of percolate outward, hmm. and we want the community to come in, and they do. Much more integrated. Yes, yes, and, and that works very, very well. We have people coming in off the street all the time, and they just come in and they say, so what exactly is it that you do here? <laughs> <laughs> and you're okay and with that? Yes, we, we actually have tours. We have regular tours, that, that we, and we just take people from the community or whoever wants to come in okay. um, through the building. Michelle, <coughs> you will still be teaching in 17 years' time, I'm sure. What's your classroom going to look like? Any idea? I wonder if my classroom will look like a space where we don't necessarily move children along by their age and their grade. I wonder if we'll be more attentive to the individual needs of our students. Currently in Ontario, if you have a student with special needs, they're on an individual education plan. Don't all students have special needs? So what might that look like? Um, it's difficult to scale something like that, but technology helps us do amazing things. So how could we scale uh, individ individual education plans for all of our students and then have them work in inter-age groups where we teach them about mentoring. And, you know, we talk a lot about bullying and acceptance, but then we separate kids into their age groups. And we have clubs, and, and those are all good things. But what, uh, what do we do to bring students together that are uh, across groups? So I wonder if it would look like that. I also wonder whether we'll become more brave and students will do even more making. I wonder about digital fabrication. I wonder about how coding comes off the screen and students make things in three-dimensional space. And I wonder what that might do to consumption of products. Maybe we're hmm. going to make things that are just exactly for us and maybe we'll solve problems through the design process in our classroom. But we're still going to be able to read, because that's an amazing thing that humans do. And we're still going to be able to know math, and hopefully a lot more of it, because that opens up incredible doors. So there's still going to be those important basics that are the building blocks of our knowledge. And then on top of that, it's going to be personalized. And on top of that, it's going to be deeply connected. And on top of that, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> I, but I just want it to happen sooner. <laughs> yes. yeah, can I say? The kids in your class are lucky. They you are. sound like a great teacher. <laughs> yeah. Lots of they imagination. Are. you got to love that. But I am not, I'm, I, thank you, but I'm not a unique case. And I'm only the way that I am because I have a network of people that I've reached out to and that support me. And, and so thank you, but I have parents that are supportive, administrators that are supportive, mentors that help me. It's you are not doing the me. wonderfully Canadian thing right now, which is sharing the glory, and that's fine. <laughs> that's good. Great. Let me get you back involved. That's sure. so delightful. I'm, you know, that's a Canadian right there. Okay. Uh, talk to us about 100 schools in 10 countries. You're trying to do something revolutionary. Sure. So. Um, we've seen a lot of investment go into technology and education, and I think typically it's been led by the purchase of technology, which means that sometimes, in fact, mostly, I think we've found that it's, it's been, there's not been enough deep thought around how do we change the pedagogies, how do we change the structures, how do we change the curriculum, etc. So um, we're working, my organisation creates partnerships. So we look at bringing together a group of uh, people who are ex experts or have a stake in a, a large problem. Uh, we've brought together some of the, the world leaders. Uh, Michael Fullen, who's a Canadian here, lives in Toronto. You may have heard of him. He does a lot Dalton of... McGinty's education advisor. Exactly. And Tony Blair's. Exactly, yeah. So he's one of the world leaders in educational reform and, and change, system change. We've brought together people who are leaders in, in how you can implement those type of changes. We've brought together people who are leaders in, in measurement. How do we think about assessment in different ways? How can we assess these new skills? rather than just focus on traditional academics. And what we're doing is we, th we thought, well, what's a big challenge? You know, what, what would be big? Maybe 100 schools? No. So we, we've gone out and invited countries to nominate 100 schools in 10 countries, 1,000 schools altogether, that we want to work with and support and make this change over a three-year period. Highly yeah. supported, but empowering the schools and the countries to make that change. But the big thing, and this is a really important thing about the power of technology, is that will be a global network. So there will be a thousand schools who are all networked and working together. Think of it as a big brain. You hmm. know? What's your budget? What's our budget? 
for it's, this project? Yeah, it's it's actually quite low. We the schools are paying themselves two thousand dollars per school. So the schools are financing this whole thing. Absolutely. Huh? Strange, hey? <laughs> Neat if you can do it. Yeah. We have heard all week long. We're on night four of five here, and we have heard. We've heard some great ideas all week long. We've heard some wonderfully futuristic ideas, some wonderfully hopeful ideas. But we also know that, because we've heard it over and over again, the education system, it doesn't matter what country or province you're in or state, it's like a tanker. And it makes these very slow turns. And I want to just get into some discussion here about who's in the way of making all this happen. And let's name names, people. What's preventing this from happening? Gerson, start us off. Oh my goodness. Um, um, I, think, um, I think there's a certain amount of inertia in the current system. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very exam-based. It's, um, it's, 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 it's got a lot of structure. That we have a lot of preconceived notions that we've built an entire system upon. And when we start unraveling some cognitive education research and we start realizing that a lot of those assumptions are kind of faulty, how do you, how do you fix that part without destroying the entire system? Um, and a lot of people advocate, well, that's why slow change is important and you can't destroy the entire thing at once. Um, and so I think that... It, it, it's, it's a, one of the, the it, problem solving is not the hard part, it's choosing which problem to solve. And I'm 22 years old and I'm a university student and I wish I had this answer. <laughs> yeah. All right, I, Eric, I, you're not 22. No. Not no, much more no. than 22, but you're not. Um, Who's in the way? I think, um, I think whoever is keeping students from having a say mm -hmm. uh, in their educational careers in the way, whether that be school boards, whoever that is. One of the things we talked about at the summit this week um, uh, was, the fa was the fact that we need to involve students more in that decision-making process. So pulling the decision-making out from the standard form that we have it now and inviting students to the table. Um, I think once we get people like you four years ago um, into that decision-making, things can change rapidly. So whoever is keeping students um, from making decisions is at fault. I, I think um, one of the areas that needs to be looked at really is policy because it's amazing that we say to schools, we want you to change, and then we put you in a straitjacket. Yeah. Hmm. And we say, you can't change because we're going to measure you this way and we're going to do these things that we've done forever and then we can't, you can't make those changes. So we need to work on policy. But the other thing I think is critical here, and this is where technology plays a really important role, is much better and much quicker measurement on what's working and what doesn't work. And so doing much faster iteration loops, much faster innovation yeah. loops. Absolutely. And Data. schools are up for it, I think. But when you have a policy environment that says we've got to research this for 10 years and come up with an absolute definitive that it's going to work and then it doesn't work, hmm. then we have a model that's broken around a policy structure. A little over a minute to go. Michelle, who's in the way? I, I will build on that point. I think that we're doing a lot of talking. We have some really fabulous words, some very flash words. We love to say 21st century skills, but I don't think we're doing enough. I think teachers, we need to be brave. We need to push ourselves to live in beta and not with just randomly doing things in the classroom, but we need to iterate more quickly. And I don't think we need to all do this at once. Let's have some test cases and see how it goes and ask some good questions because it's not all glorious and fantastic when you add a device. Let's see what the affordances is, are and the constraints. Let's Let's do some testing and push out. I think we need to change the model of how we do professional development, as has been said here this evening. What we often do is we take the superstar teachers, we take them out of classrooms, we put them at the board office, and then they come and talk back to teachers about what we're supposed to do. Teachers, we're, we're not super trusting always of people that aren't in the classroom, don't have classroom practice. Let's contextualize the learning. Let's live life in beta. Let's live life in beta. Let's try stuff like out. Cool. Okay, like you get the last word tonight. I like that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, can we thank our panel for being here this evening? That was a really great discussion. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.